So my name's Matt, and I'm happy to be uh, talking with you today about pandas. Um, so let me just get a read of the room. Who knows what pandas are? And I'm not talking about the animal. Okay, so some of you. Who in here uses Python? Who doesn't use Python? Who doesn't want to raise their hand? Okay, some of you, okay. Um, cool, so I, I'm going to be talking about this library called Pandas, which I think it is pretty useful. Um, let me... Um, here, here's the extent of my Polish, so excuse me. Witash Shwishie. Okay. Um, so, so what is Pandas? Um, pi people often say that Python, this Python language, is the second best language for everything. And, um, and, and I, I think that's an okay uh, description of Python. And, and so one of the tools that's super popular in Python these days is this Pandas library. And so this Pandas library is a library for data manipulation. So, uh, so when people ask what this is, I like to say that it is a DSL, um, a, a language for uh, manipulating tabular data. It's also, you could describe it as a, a NoSQL in-memory database for Python, but it's also an API in that it looks like the pandas and the wider data community have somewhat converged on using pandas as an API for manipulating data. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and um, how, how it's used. So I've got this table here that, that shows some common tools for manipulating data. We got pandas in, in the left-hand side. We got R, we got SQL, we got Spark and Excel. So apologize if your favorite tool is not on here. Um, but, but some of the reasons why I, I like pandas is um, well, well, one, it's in Python, which I think is an okay language, pretty good for a lot of things. Um, but also, pandas can scale with you. So uh, it works for small data. It all, the pandas API works for small data. It also works for median scale data. And I'm an advisor for a company called Ponder. What Ponder does is they take your pandas code, you change the import, and then pandas, the same code that runs on your small data, will also work on tools like BigQuery or Snowflake. So you can use that same code and it will run in, in the database, which is pretty cool. Um, Pandas also has a huge API, and we're going to explore some of that today. And a, a large community, as I said, like Python community has somewhat converged on, on using Pandas as, as the tool. So, so you can compare that with other tools like SQL. Everyone's like, why, why wouldn't you use SQL everywhere? Well, SQL, SQL is pretty good. I mean, it works in small, medium, large data. Um, it doesn't really have visualization, so to speak, unless you plug it into other tools. Um, and, and then some of these things that you can do with like one line of SQL uh, tend to be a, a lot more, or one line of pandas tend to be a lot more in SQL. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so a little bit about me. I, I like to say that I, I sell snake oil and I teach people to tell lies with data. But uh, my, I, I work as a, as a corporate trainer, and I go around, and um, I uh, teach people about Python and, and data science. And a, a few weeks ago, a team came to me, and this company had almost 1,000 engineers, and they were uh, really kind of concerned because they thought, we, we have been in business for almost 10 years. We've got a lot of engineers, but we really haven't done anything with data. And now that we have these large language models, ChatGPT and friends coming out, we're a little concerned that if we don't start taking advantage of AI, so to speak, uh, our, co our competitors are gonna eat our lunch. And so uh, I, I w they asked me for some training around Python and data, and I went in, and pandas is one of the first things that I taught them. Because my experience is that a lot of people have data sitting around in Excel or in uh, databases, and they haven't really done that much with it. And pandas lets you pull that out and start uh, 
asking some tough questions, but also uh, you can go further and start integrating that with uh, powerful libraries to do machine learning, predictive modeling, that sort of thing. So, so Mike Panda's background, um, out of school, I have a computer science degree, and I, I started working with natural language processing back in 2000. Uh, around 2006, I created a business intelligence backend uh, for, for doing uh, cube pro uh, um, transformations to data. Um, around 2009, I went to PyCon and heard about this library called Pandas, which sounded pretty cool because it was doing a lot of the same things my library did. And then I started using Pandas uh, in uh, various uh, uh, things that I needed to do at work. Um, in the meantime, I, I transitioned from being an employee to doing more consulting and corporate training and uh, wrote a couple books on pandas, uh, did some stuff with Spark, um, wrote some more books on pandas. Um, I wrote this, this book here. We'll give, we'll give this away later today. Um, and then I, I've also messed around with some other libraries as well. So there's a library called QDF, which is basically taking the pandas API and porting it to GPUs. So if you've got beefy GPUs, you can take that same code and run on GPUs. There's Modin, which is taking that same API and making it scale out to distributed systems. And then we have tools like uh, uh, Ponder, which is uh, taking that same API and throwing it on to uh, large uh, data stores. And, and we also have tools like Polars, which is kind of like a next generation data frame implementation. And then a few weeks ago, Pandas 2.0 came out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through some of the features of Pandas here for you and uh, give you some opinions. Um, so the, these opinions, I talk about my background not to brag necessarily, but to, but to um, give you a basis of where these opinions come from. So I'm, I'm going to, for those of you who raise your hand and say you use pandas, hopefully um, I'll give you some insights into maybe writing better pandas code. For those who haven't used Python or pandas, Hopefully this gives you some insight into some of the things that you can do with these libraries and maybe inspires you to start uh, checking out, uh, messing around with your data, and seeing if you can get uh, some value from that. OK, so, so f uh, f first things first. Uh, so like I said, th this li uh, Pandas 2.0 just came out. Um, a few weeks ago, and one of the big things about this is it's using a back-end library called Arrow. And um, uh, let, let me just go in maybe some detail about this. Uh, Python is not a fast language, which might seem weird that Python is one of the most popular languages today, and it's one of the most popular languages for data science, but it's a slow language. You might think, why, why, why would someone use Python to do that? And uh, the reason I think I have a job using Python today is this library called NumPy. Basically, at a high level, what NumPy is doing is it's giving you a Python interface to a lot of op optimized operations happening basically at the C level. And, and so instead of, in, in Python, when you create a number, you make an object and there's a lot of overhead for a single number. Uh, and in, in NumPy, you can say, I want to make 1,000 numbers, and you don't have overhead for each of those 1,000 numbers. You just have overhead for the single object. And then you can push operations down to NumPy so it can take advantage of modern CPU architecture, do like SIMD instructions and broadcast operations. So you're basically getting a lot of the benefits of C uh, if you were to program in C, but you're writing it in Python. And so we know like from studies that generally number of lines of code correlate to number of bugs in your code. Um, so if, if you can write less code, generally you can have uh, less bugs, but also we can write less code but have it be performant, which is, is super nice. Um, so, so that's kind of the reason why Python is popular among data folks today is because, not because Python, the language, is fast per se, but we have other libraries that we're building on top of. Now, the NumPy library had some flaws in it that people didn't like, and so basically what this Py, PyArrow backend is doing is it's, you can think of it as sort of like a newer NumPy backend that has a, a few features that people like. Um, 
Okay, so, so if you are trying this at home, if you're following this at home, you'll want to uh, make sure that you have installed the Pyro backend if you install Pandas as well. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run my imports here. Note that I, I have this commented outline, import mode in Pandas as PD. As I said, like, you can, people have all also converged on the Pandas API as the API for data manipulation in Python. And so if you wanted to do some scale out, you could replace your import pandas with this uh, import mode in as PD, and the rest of the code should just work in here, but it would allow you to scale out to multiple machines. So that's kind of nice. Contrast that with something like Spark, where Spark has a pandas API, but you're going to have to change some of the code to make it work uh, w uh, directly. So again, I'm using this pandas uh, 2.0.1. I'm going to set a... Uh, uh, c configuration here, and we're going to read some data. So uh, unlike, unlike maybe s most of the other talks you say, I don't have a lot of pretty pictures in here. Well, we'll make some pretty pictures, but mostly I'm going to be showing you some code, and, and so I hope, I hope that you can follow along with this code. I'm going to read a data set here. So I'm going to say uh, read CSV. This is a data set that comes from the U.S. government. Uh, in the U.S., the government uh, issues this data set every car uh, type that's sold there. It has like fuel economy standards from that, like how many miles per gallon. We have this thing called miles per gallon. I think it's like liters per 100 kilometers in Europe and everywhere else in, in the world, but U U.S. uses miles and weird things like that. So, so it has like uh, reporting on that and like how many uh, gallons of gas you, your car will use in a year, that sort of thing. And, and so because I'm using this pandas2 library, I'm going to say use this pyro backend and use uh, pyro as an engine, and that's going to give me some of the benefits of this new library here. And what we're going to do uh, th th for the next few minutes here is we're going to build up this function here, which is a function to clean up your data. I don't know about you, but I've worked in a lot of different companies and consulted for a lot of different companies, and I've never had data sort of handed to me on a platter that just works as is. Generally, my data is pretty messy. Uh, and so I need to go through some steps to clean it up and get it ready to either do machine learning, do reporting on it, answer that question that my boss wanted. So we're, I'm going to show you how I would build up this code to do this um, from scratch. Now, if you look at this, a lot of, um, does anyone here follow me on social media? No, okay, that's okay. Okay, we got one person. Um, so, so, so one of the things, here, here's a hint for you. If you want to get like uh, attention on social media, just, just post something controversial. And so one thing you can do is you can post code like this. Turns out this code is very controversial and um, you will get a lot of strong opinions on this on, on social media. Most people say like, that's the worst code ever. Um, and then you'll have these other people who are like, um, actually, once I learned how to do that, that actually makes sense and made my life a lot easier. And that's sort of the prem premise of my book here, is that I, I've used uh, this library for a long time, and um, I, I've got some hints, I think, that will help you write better code. So, so again, here is our data here. It's this autos data set, and this is a data frame. This comes out of uh, pandas here, and so um, this has like 41,000 rows and 83 columns of data. So again, like how many barrels it uses, what's the charge for electric vehicles, um, when it was created, etc. So a, a, bunch of, a bunch of data on here, and we're not going to use all of this, but uh, if I were to look at how much memory this is using, uh, on, in Pandas 2, this is using like 29 megs of memory, which, which isn't a big deal, but again, for, for Pandas, the library, you need to remember that Pandas needs to fit stuff in memory uh, to, to manipulate. Now, again, there are some other libraries that, that use the Pandas API that don't require that, but for Pandas, we do, and, and so oftentimes, you do want to know like how much memory you're using. Um, Pandas also has a lot of functionality here. So, so if you're familiar with Python, there's this DIR built in in Python that basically tells you how many attributes an object has in Python. And we're looking at this autos data frame thing, and there's 500 different attributes of that. Uh, so, so that's 
uh, a lot of functionality that is in Pandas that you can do to this data frame or this table of data. Now, we contrast that with a Python list, which is like an array if you're not familiar with that. And a, a list has like 47 things. So there's like over 10 times as much functionality. I'm going to show you that it's even more than that in one of these data frames than there is in, in one of these more basic data structures here. So, so we're going to start off, and we're just going to limit the number of columns we're going to look at. So we're going to look at uh, the city mileage, how, what, what the mileage we get driving around the city. We have this combined mileage, uh, which is the combination of city mileage and highway mileage. We have the number of cylinders in, in there. We have the displacement of the engine, the drive of the engine, the engine description, how much the fuel will cost in a year, the make, the model transmission type, the range, uh, when this data was created, and the year of the car. Now, I'll be the first to say I am not a car person, so if I say something that's like uh, bad, uh, feel free to correct me. Maybe do it uh, not in public, but after, after the talk here. Happy, happy to take feedback on that. But we can look at, at um, we can say, OK, pull off those columns and look at these D types here. And this is going to tell us uh, when we read this CSV file, this comma separated value file, what the types of the data were. And one of the nice things about CSV files, does anyone here use CSV files? A few people. OK, one of the nice things about CSV files is that they're human readable. And that's the only nice thing about them. Um, they don't really have, th have a, they didn't really have a standard until recently after the world made a bunch of CSV files. And, um, there's no information in them about schemas or what types things are. And so Pandas is going to try and make a best effort to determine what the types are from these CSV files. But some people will put in things like question mark for missing data. Other people will put in like period for missing data. And so there might just be some missing data in there that we, we don't know about. Um, you can see like the created on, that's a date, but it, didn't, it says that this is a, a string in here down here. So uh, we kind of want to make sure that our data is cleaned up a little bit. Um, also, you'll note that because I am using that Pyro backend, this is not back in Pandas 1. It was backed by NumPy as a backend. This is using the Pyro backend. Um, so we can ask Pandas, one of the 400 things that we can do with it is we can say, how big is each of these columns? How much memory is it taking? And uh, then we can even go further on that. We can say, let's sum up the result of that. And, and from this, we get uh, that there's seven megs here. This is Pandas 2. If we were using Pandas 1, the same code here, we would get like almost three times as much memory in Pandas uh, 1, just because, again, that Pandas 2 is slightly uh, using that arrow back end is slightly more optimized. So we, we've already seen that we've got, uh, just by you know, using Pandas 2, uh, if you're a Pandas 1 person, can save you qu quite a bit of uh, uh, memory here. I'm going to walk through a process that I would use if, if someone were to give me some data, maybe as a consultant, uh, some of the things that I would do to clean up the data here. So one of the first things I would do is just sort of look at what I have in there and I can do this using this describe method here. So uh, first I'm doing, I'm saying pull off the columns that I'm curious about. And of those, just select the integer type columns. And of those, uh, do this describe. Uh, so you know, I, I'm showing a lot of the, uh, or you know, three different things of functionality that I can do here. And one time I was teaching this to a bunch of people. And when, when I showed them describe, I went, and I said, what's wrong? Did I say something wrong? And they said, no, we just spent the last three weeks implementing summary statistics on top of our BI uh, tool in SQL. And, and if we knew that we could use pandas, we could do this in one line of code. So this gives you like the count. Uh, count has a special meaning in pandas. It's, it's the number of non-missing rows, which is a little bit weird. Um, the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, and the inner quartiles there. So we got like the 50th percentile, which is also the median there. Um, and what I like to do is just go through this and sort of get a gut check of what my data looks like. Uh, one of the things that might be interesting in Pandas is, is uh, if you look at this, the default types here that it's using for integers is an 8-byte integer. Um, and if you know about integers, like some of these are only going up to like 124. We probably don't need 8 bytes of information to do that. So we might be able to get by a, with a, a, a smaller type rather than using a 64-bit integer there. 
Um, one more thing here, and this is uh, one of the key things from this talk here, is that I wrote this as one line of code, and I, I said previously that lines of code correlate to bugs, but I'm actually going to write this as, as this example down here using what I call chaining. And so this is a way to, for me to uh, wrap this in parentheses. And when I wrap my Python code in parentheses, uh, it tells it I don't have to worry about white space rules. So I can basically take this and I can say, like, OK, uh, let's uh, start off with uh, our data frame. Here's our data frame here. And then uh, let's pull off the columns from that. And then let's select the integers from that. And then on that, let's. Uh, describe that. So I like to write it this way. It makes me write a little bit more, but it also forces me. It's a constraint that forces me to uh, basically write this as a recipe. These are the steps that I'm going to do to my data to clean it up. OK, so let's ask NumPy like, what, the, what the range of these numbers can be. And you can ask NumPy. You can say, like, what can an 8-bit integer be? And it can go from like, negative 128 to 127. There's also unsigned 8 bits. And so, uh, for example, if you look at a lot of these, uh, for example, um, like this one right here, city mileage could not use an 8-bit integer, but it could use an unsigned 8-bit integer, right? Because if you look at the minimum value, it actually doesn't go negative. I don't know what negative miles per gallon means, um, but uh, I don't, I don't know that cars support that right now. So it might be worthwhile to change that to an unsigned 8-bit integer. We'd, we'd be using an eighth the amount of memory. So I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to say, um, using this as type, one of those 400 things I can do is I can pass in a dictionary here mapping the column to the type of each of those. And so uh, we can do that. And we can ask, also ask it um, you know, to describe this, and it looks like this is kind of a lossless transformation. We're going to be saving a lot of memory and not losing anything in there. Now, um, let's just go through some of these other types here. Uh, so I might say, like, let's take the range and convert that to an unsigned 8-bit integer. And Python complains. Uh, Panda says, no, you can't do that because the value 265 is not in there. So we might want to say, OK, let's do a histogram of the range column. And all I have to do is tack on this hist here, and I get a, a, a histogram, a plot, using the matplotlib library that's integrated with pandas here. Well, it's a little bit hard to see what's going on here, because it looks like most of these have a value around 0. But because this, the range of this, or, or the domain of the x-axis here, goes up to like 350, presumably there's some values that are a little bit higher, but it looks like most of the 40,000 have values of 0. Well, not a problem for pandas. Let's just stick in this query in here to filter out anything that has a range above 20. And then we can see, OK, yeah, there are a bunch of entries here, but like, there's only like 26 of them maximum uh, in a single value that, that uh, e exists here versus the 40,000. So we're seeing that this scale here blows those out, out, and we can't really see that. And I might use some other code here. I might want to say, OK, let's, let's describe it. And then I'm going to use this loc selector here to say, I want to select all of the columns. This is a column selector. And I want to select the columns where the value is less than 255. So these are all the columns less than 255. But I could also go the other way. What's greater than 255? And I could say, OK, for fuel cost, I might need to use a different type. Uh, range and year might need to use a different type as well. So I can just go through this process and say, like, OK, well, range we can use a 16-bit integer, and year we can use a 16-bit integer. Check if that works. Again, Pandas 2 is going to complain if it doesn't. So it looks like it did. If we look at our memory usage at this point, we're now down to like 5.5 megs. So not a huge saving, but we have saved you know, uh, maybe 20% of our memory just by doing that. We can do a similar thing with floating point numbers as well. Um, in this case, there aren't a lot of floating point numbers. There's this engine displacement here. Um, in pandas 1, if I were using pandas 1, cylinders would have come in as a floating point value. But in pandas 2, it's not because it's using this pi arrow back end. Um, so so um, the problem in, in pandas 1, pandas 1, one of the reasons people want to get rid of that NumPy backend is because NumPy didn't support missing values. And it turns out that Cylinders has some missing values in it. And, and so in, in uh, pandas 1, 
it would, it would say that this was a floating point rather than an integer. And I don't know how you have like partial cylinders of a car engine. Uh, so cylinders probably would want that to be an integer-like. Um, and, and again, in Pandas 2, this kind of does the right thing. But you might want to know like why are those values missing, especially if you're going to do like some machine learning on this afterwards. Uh, a lot of your machine learning libraries really don't like to have values missing. So it is important to kind of go through your data and understand why it's missing. And this is actually not hard in pandas, per se. We can say, OK, uh, let's run this query here. Where is cylinders missing? Is, is NA? And we can go through here and look at like the makes and the models. And it looks like a lot of these are electric cars. So maybe I come in here and say, OK, um, I'm going to update the cylinders column. And I'm going to say, OK, where that's missing, rather than leaving it empty, we'll just fill it in with zeros here. And maybe I'll do the same thing with engine displacement as well. And I can go through this. And as I'm doing this, check what I'm doing, make sure that uh, our, our results make sense. Um, you know, I, I might say, OK, let's change some of the types here, these floating point types. I've got 64-bit integers. Maybe those are too big. Um, and so, I, again, I can ask NumPy what the range of that is. And I'm going to say, OK, let's convert like displacement to a 16-bit instead of a 64-bit. And when I do that, um, we get an error here. And it says that, uh, no, you can't do that. This is, this is not implemented in, in Arrow. So Arrow doesn't implement float 16, but it does implement float 32. And so uh, we can save you know, half the memory by doing that if we wanted to convert it to a, a float 32. Um, so if I look at my memory now, instead of 5.5 megs, I'm down to like 5 megs. So not huge savings, but I, I am getting some savings. I'm also understanding my data as I'm going through this process. Um, one of the reasons I think that uh, you might have issues with, with like some of these chat GPT or other things is, is people are going to say, well, let's let the, the AI do it for me. Um, and the AI can do a lot of cool things, but you want to be careful that you actually know what the AI is doing. And um, I think that manually going through your data is actually a, a good thing if you care about it. Um, let's look at the string types in here. Um, in pandas 1, we would say object, because that's how they're represented. But pandas 2 has the string type. So we've got uh, the drive, the engine description, the make, the model, the transmission, and created on. It looks like drive is like what I would call categorical. There's not very many options there. Engine description is a little bit weird. It's got like parentheses and commas in there. So it, it's kind of weird. Uh, make and model, those look categorical as well. Transmission is an interesting one. It actually looks like there's two pieces of information in there, whether a car is an automatic car or a manual, and the number of speeds. And then this created one isn't even a string. I mean, it's stored as a string, but it's actually a date. So I'm going to go through uh, just changing these. Uh, uh, I might come to drive. And one of the 400 things that I like to do is this value counts here gives me uh, the count of each of the entries here. And you can see that like, there, there's like 1,100 of these that are missing from that. And I could say, like, where are these uh, drive values missing? In pandas 1, I would say drive is an A. Pandas 2 actually converts that to an empty string here. So we could look where these are missing. And again, these probably look like um, electric vehicles. And if I wanted to, I could say, like, OK, well, let's look at the, in, uh, the drives that aren't missing. What do those look like? And I could just sample you know, 10 rows and look at you know, what those drives that aren't missing look like. OK, and then maybe I, I say, OK, well, I'm going to say, you know, if it is missing, we're going to replace it with other, and then we're going to convert it to a categorical type. And I'm also going to convert, like, make to a categorical type. And when I do that, my memory is now down at, like, 3.8. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's look at transmission here. And transmission is that one that I said looks like it has two pieces of data, whether something's automatic or manual, but also the number of speeds. Um, so let's deal with that. I might say, um, let's make a column called automatic. It's just whether the, the transmission contains the automatic column. And let's make strings here uh, using the ability to extract data as a regular expression from that and convert that uh, to a, a number here. Let's run that and see what happens. And I got an error. And it's like, OK. Um, this, so one of the things, uh, Pandas 2 is, is still coming up with feature parity with Pandas 1 for some of these. Like, extract is not implemented with Pandas 2. So I kind of, in this case, have to like 
revert back to pandas one type. You're going to say convert transmission to a string and then do that. It looks like that does work. Um, but, it, but one of the things that, remember I said you've got 400 different things you can do with a pandas data frame. Well, if you have a column that's a string, you've got another like almost 100 things that you can do on string columns. Um, and and here's, here's a Python string. There's like 80 things you can do with a Python string. I'm just doing some, uh, the Venn diagram here, the, the union of, of both of those, or the intersection of both of those, excuse me. And there's 63 things in common that you can do with a Python string and a string that is a, a string column here. So a lot of that uh, Python knowledge uh, transfers over. Okay, let's look at this created on. This one looks like it's a date. And um, I'm gonna just say PD to date time, try and convert that to a date column. And pandas gives me an error. It actually gives me some useful information. It says like, you might try to pass in a format string. So let's pass in a format string here. This is an uh, ISO, uh, 8601 format string here. And that looks like it works. Um, however, I'm just showing you the first 10 lines where it does work. If I try and do that with the whole thing, it turns out that it doesn't work. Um, if we had more time, I'd go over like what's going on here. But uh, for the sake of, of uh, demo here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, let's replace uh, these time zones with the offsets here and then run that. And it looks like uh, Pandas is happy with that. And if we look at the type now, it's no longer a string type, but it's now this date time type that's in the uh, UTC format here. Um, and then once I have it in UTC, I can say, well, let's convert that maybe to the, the New York time zone here. And uh, let's see if that worked. And it looks like it did. It's now in the New York time zone. Uh, and so uh, again, uh, if I have something converted as a date, uh, I've got another uh, lot of operations that I can do to this now. In fact, um, it looks like there's another 80 things that I can do on date columns as well. So now my chain looks like this, and I'm now down to like two megs for doing that. Uh, so, so again, uh, we're, we're saving a, a bit of memory, but I'm also going through that data and cleaning it up. Let's look at this engine description one. This is kind of a mess. It looks like there's like 550 unique values. There's like a bunch of uh, missing values. There's a bunch of these FFS values here. There's like spaces in here, which is kind of weird. And then like parentheses around this. This, this looks like this is the bane of data science every, scientists everywhere. This is probably freeform data. Someone probably wrote a book and said like, when you're entering this um, engine description, use these things. And everyone kind of used them in their own way. And so we have a bunch of entries down here at the bottom that are unique. Um, we're not even showing all of them because there's 500 different things here. So I'm just gonna, uh, say like, okay, it looks like FFS is important there. So I'm just gonna make a new column called an indicator column, whether that contains FFS. And then I'm going to drop um, that engine description column here. Um, and, and so if we do that, we're down to like 1.8 megs from doing that. Now at this point, what I would do is I could convert this into a Python function. A lot of people who are using like a tool like Jupyter like this will just leave things at the global level. But what I like to do is throw this into a function and then I'll take this function and put it up at the very top of my notebook. Then when I come back to my notebook, I load the raw data and I can immediately run through this function here and clean it up. Why do I like to work with raw data? Well, because inevitably my experience is when uh, I make a report or I make a prediction, uh, the boss comes back to me and says, where did this data come from? Or why is this saying this? And if I have like all of this stuff that I've done in different cells or I've manually changed things or I'm using uh, a data set that wasn't from the, the data source here, it's really hard to trace through it. But this is basically a recipe and I can walk through it one line at a time and see what's gone on with it. Um, one of the other things that Python or Pandas 2 brought is this um, copy on write mode. Um, so th this is kind of nice. Um, whoops. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do a, a benchmark of this, and then I'm going to uh, do another benchmark of this with it turned on. So basically, this is saying, like, if you're making a new data frame uh, that's derived from another one and you don't change something, don't copy it, just use the same one. And if we, 
if we turn this mode on, this is a new mode in, in Python 2 or Pandas 2. We, sa we save a little bit here, maybe like 10% here. Uh, it turns out that this operation here isn't doing a lot of copies per se, but if we had a really copy-heavy operation, it would save a lot of time here. So this chain style is often called flow programming. Again, a lot of people find this uh, controversial. I think part of that is because um, if you look at like a lot of the pandas documentation out there, you'll see uh, articles are like 20 top things to do with pandas, and it's showing all these things in isolation. You can do one of these, and there's 400 things, and I'll show you each one of them in isolation. But my experience is that I don't, when I'm working with real world data, I don't work on one thing in isolation. I have a bunch of different things that I need to do with my data. And so I really do want to make this recipe that says what I want to do with my data. Um, and, and so uh, I, I do like this. A lot of people will write this something like this, where they like write all these all on one line of code, or they'll put them in 50 different cells, and they'll get a bunch of errors in here as they're doing this. Um, and, and so, Again, I don't recommend doing it this way. I've done it this way. I know a lot of people who have done it this way. And uh, writing that chain is just going to make your life a lot easier. Another complaint I get is, like, how do you debug this if you've written in a chain? And, um, I mean, it turns out, like, as you've seen, I've been kind of debugging this as I've been going, right? Checking my work as I've been going. Um, that's one of the ways that I debug it, but people are like, well, I mean, really, you, you might want that intermediate va variable that you, you, that's in your chain. Well, if I want that, I can actually get that. There's a, f a method called pipe. One of the 400 different things you can do is called pipe. And so I can do things like this. Here I'm just going to say uh, pass in an arbitrary function. It takes the current state of the data frame. In this case, I'm going to print the shape and return the data frame here. But you can also do something that's kind of a hack like this. I can say, like, let's m pass in a function called get var. We're going to do that right down here. And this get var function is going to take the current state of the data frame in a variable name, and then it's just going to inject the current state of the data frame as a variable into my globals. So when I run this, this should make a variable called uh, df3 that is the state of my data frame after this. And you can see that I've also uh, put some more prints in here. So, at, and when we, when we run this, um, we should see here, right here, you see the size, how many rows and columns as we're stepping through this. Um, and then if we come down here at df3, this is actually the intermediate variable. So you see that you can, if you want to, you can debug these things and you can dive into them if you want to. Another thing that I'll do is I'll just comment it out and sort of step through it if I want to, to make sense of it. So this is going to make it easier for you to test your code, um, deploy it, and actually use it in production. Now, another thing that people who look at my code will say, well, pandas, part of these 400 different things, a lot of them have an option parameter that says, uh, do this in place. And uh, the, the methods that I'm calling actually return new data frames. They don't mutate in place. Um, I've got a quote here from one of the core Pandas developers. Uh, it says that uh, in place really doesn't do in place. Um, actually, most of the time, it's actually making a copy under the covers and returning it. So the Pandas core developers, like, uh, most people are using this erroneously. In fact, there's a bug here to actually remove it from Pandas. Uh, just because it's more of an anti-pattern and, and people misinterpret it. Another thing that you might want to be careful with in Pandas is um, function application. This is another one of those things that you'll see popular in, in blogs and whatnot. Um, so again, this is kind of uh, US-centric, but if I wanted to convert this to liters per 100 kilometers, I believe the math goes something like this. And so if I have a function that takes a value and converts it from miles per gallon to liters per 100, I can say, let's apply this to the city column, right? And, and I can do that, and it looks like it works. Um, it turns out I can also do this vectorized operation here. I can just say, well, let, let's just take 235 and divide it by the city column, and this broadcasts that operation to the whole column. Now, these look very similar. I mean, the output of this is the same, um, but these are actually two different things. This top example where I have the function is crossing that Python uh, we would say, in this case, the Python arrow boundary, and we're taking data out of the, the pi arrow back and putting it into Python to call that function with it and then sticking back in. So it turns out there's actually quite a bit of overhead doing that. And um, 
I'm just going to do a micro benchmark on these. Um, when I ran this, I believe yesterday, on my machine, it was like 60 times slower to do this uh, versus this broadcast operation here. So just be aware of that when you're crossing that boundary, especially with numeric operations, that's something to be aware of. Now, strings are a little bit not as optimized as numbers. It's harder to do string operations that way. Um, and so it turns out that we do get some benefits um, in pandas 2 by using the pi arrow back end. You can see this top one here. I'm using uh, whether a, a um, auto is from a certain country. I'm just saying like if it's in one of these, it's a US auto, otherwise it's an other country. Um, this takes uh, 500 microseconds to do that. If I actually convert this back to the pandas 1 type, it takes like six times as long in pandas 1. And if I try and do this without doing apply, it's actually longer on the string type. So the takeaway here is if you're working with math objects especially, you want to be careful about keeping those math operations inside of that um, in either the NumPy or the Pi arrow back end. OK, for my last section, I want to talk about aggregation. These are kind of the things that your boss wants to know. You know, I, I, I like to imagine like you're, you work at maybe a candy store and your boss says, how are we doing today? And your boss really doesn't want to know that Susie came in and bought a Tootsie Roll, a piece of gum, and a lollipop, and then Billy came in and bought a candy bar and a piece of gum. What your boss wants to know is the number of people, the total number of people that came in, the sum. <laughs> Uh, there were 58 people who came in. They bought $500 worth of, of things, the average size, right? We're going to take that data and collapse it. We call that an aggregation. These are the things that your boss generally wants to know. So let's imagine that our boss asked us, um, what is the mileage by country by year, right? You might think, okay, how do I do this? And this is kind of like those math problems where you need to convert uh, math to code. This is actually where, like, uh, language models uh, can help quite a bit if, if you can formulate the problem. Now it becomes a problem of formulating this uh, in English or whatnot so the language model can convert it to code for you. Um, but we're going to convert this question into code. And so one of the 400 things you can do is you can do a group by. So let's say we're going to group by the year column and then do the mean. And it turns out in Pandas 2 it doesn't like this because Pandas 2 wants to be a little bit more explicit. And it says, you've got a categorical entry in there, and I don't know how to take the mean of a categorical. So we actually have to do something like this where I say, OK, let's group by year, but let's only do it on the numeric columns. And so with this code here, you can see that this returns a data frame, but in the index, that thing on the left-hand side that's in bold now, instead of just having a number that's a default index, we have the year. And now for every numeric column, we have uh, the average value. This is pretty cool. I mean, I could write this as one line of code, but uh, we, can, we can do some fancy calculations now. So now I'm going to say, uh, let's group by year, but instead of doing all the columns, let's just pull out like the combined columns and the speeds column, and we can get a summary like that. Um, I'm going to actually plot this because I'm a huge fan of plotting, and you can actually see things by plotting that you wouldn't see otherwise. So here is um, my result of this. You see I have a data frame. I have year in the index, and I have two columns combined and speeds. And when I add a plot on this, this is going to leverage the matplotlib library. What it's going to do is it's going to take the index and put it in the x-axis and each of those columns as its own line. And I get something that looks like that. So it's pretty easy to start visualizing this and say, oh, look at that. Around 2010, there's a big bump that comes up. And uh, you know, there's a bunch of different aggregations I can do. I can say, instead of the mean, I can do the 30th percent quantile, or I can do the median, or I can do the standard deviation. Once you understand how these things work, really easy to change out these aggregations in there. I can also say, let's group by two columns. Let's group by year and country. And then I get something that looks like this. That's, this might have information that I'm looking for, right? Year and country. Um, I can also tell it to do multiple aggregations. I can say, let's calculate the min, the mean, and this arbitrary second to last uh, aggregation that I made right here. And I can get something that looks like this. this. For those who are Excel people, this might look like a pivot table that you're familiar with. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to go back to this one right here. I'm going to say, okay, we're going to group by year and country. So you can see that I actually have two values in my index here, the year end for each year. I have country, US, and other. And then we're going to take the mean of that. Um, I could try and plot that here. Um, if I plot that, it actually is kind of ugly because it's going to plot the index. And in this case, the index is the year and country. So it looks kind of weird over here. So let me show you what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to change this a little bit. And I'm going to do this unstack operation. So watch what happens. The unstack is going to take country, and it's going to throw up into the columns. OK, so that's kind of weird. But now I, I've, I've like d done a little pivot there where I have pulled that up there. And then what I can do is I can say, OK, once I unstack that, let's pull off the city column. So here's what we had. We had the unstack. I'm going to say, let's pull off the city column, because this is a hierarchical column. It's got two columns below us, US and other. And then at this point, let's do a plot of that. This is going to plot uh, the year in the x-axis and the US versus the other right there. And I've got this legend on top, so I'm going to kick that off to the side by doing this. OK, so uh, th this is kind of a lot of code here. But once you start understanding this, it makes it really easy to do some cool operations here. Here I'm just tacking on a rolling 3D, three period rolling average to smooth that out if you want to get rid of that. Really easy to do that. It's two additional lines of code just to do a, a rolling mean average. Here I'm going to do a little example here uh, comparing like the mileage of various makes over the time. And that's a decent plot. Um, I'm going to show how to like quickly change that and make it fancier. So I can use matplotlib to clean that up and make this look uh, pretty fancy like that if I want to. And this, this tells a nice story, right? I mean, when you look at this, your eyes immediately go to Tesla there. OK, so uh, that, that's the content that I had. Um, in summary, I think if you want to get started with data, a lot of people have data sitting around in Excel or on a SQL database. And being able to pull that out and start doing these kind of operations is super powerful. There's a lot of value that you can add by being able to do that. Um, embrace this chaining style. Try it out. See if it makes your life better. Um, Remember, if you're doing application, that's going to be slow for math operations. These aggregations are super powerful. My advice is to play with them and start getting that syntax, uh, getting comfortable with that syntax. Again, this API that Pandas has, you can do scale out to big data using things like um, Modin and Ponder. Um, OK, so I, I am on Twitter. I post controversial things like this. I don't post a lot of cat pictures here. I do want to do a book giveaway here. So um, this might be a little bit hard here. But um, I think there's 22 rows here. So I'm going to randomly choose one of those. Um, so if you're on row 12, will you stand up if you're interested in this book? On, on, on the edge, is, it says what row you're on. I know counting is hard. OK, here we go. So we, how many people we have standing up on row 12? I'm, I'm just going to point to the people standing up. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. OK, we've got 11 people standing up. Um, so one is on that side, and 11 is on the other side. So we're going to go from 1 to 12, because Python follows that half of an interval. So we've got two. Uh, your friend over there, you won the book here. OK, um, awesome. I think we might have time for a question or two. Um, yeah? OK, um, I'll be around the conference. If you want to talk or chat, happy to chat. Um, uh, have a great conference, everyone. Thanks for letting me be here. Uh, and yeah, enjoy.